it makes the existence you want to live feel possible. It makes it feel like a bit like you can always imagine it, but when you see someone do it on screen, it feels like you're closer to them. It feels like I did that, so I'm part of it. So it is possible. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss one of the games that made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronoun she, her. I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. Why are you laughing at me? I'm sorry. I just, I for folks who can't see us, which is everyone, we're all, we do these on Zoom, and I was, I, I was looking at Jamie and nodding and smiling like a rictus <laughs> mannequin, and I looked, to, I just looked to the left and saw myself in the reflection of Zoom, and I was terrified. So I just wanted to commend you for getting through that <laughs> intro. <laughs> this uh, 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 yeah, so this is Pixel Therapy. Pull up your armchair. Feel free to lie down on the couch. Uh, we're going to hop right the fuck into it today. Spencer, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Tell me tell me all about you. I'm great, Jamie. Thank you for asking. Um, <coughs> oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I swear. <laughs> I <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I I... I got the air purifier. I thought my problems would be <laughs> solved, but maybe it's anxiety cough. I have like four different coughs. I have okay. anxiety cough. Mm-hmm. I have a uh, nasal drip cough, which I get mm. in the mornings. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, oh, I have terrible seasonal allergies. So there's seasonal allergy cough. And yeah. if I ever have a fourth one, that's probably means I need to get another COVID test. So we won't hope, we'll hope that we don't ever have to get to that. Okay. Anyway. This is a video game podcast. Welcome. Um, today, <laughs> <laughs> I actually did it. Uh, I mean, I've been playing um, AC Valhalla, which uh, I now realize the cool people say AC when they're talking about Assassin's Creed. Oh, really? Creed. I just I call it that. Ass Cree. I'm going to oh. play some Ass Cree. I'm trying to make that um, take take. <laughs> take hold in the cultural yeah. lexicon and how's that working there in your apartment Ask Cree. <laughs> is it really catching on uh my partner's smiling in the background so hopefully that means that he likes it <laughs> <laughs> um but you know i i i think i talked about uh assassin's creed last time so i, I kind of wanted to take a departure since i'm still i'm now i was like 48 hours in last time we all spoke and now i'm like 80 hours in. Um, Whoa. Yeah, it's... it's I, live, I live there now. Um, <laughs> but there was some gaming news that came out. I guess this is like last week's news by the time this episode's coming out, but I figure a lot of y'all out there are probably not... Uh, don't have Twitter alerts, notifications on in their phones for hot gaming news. But essentially, Sony, uh, who, who makes the PlayStation that we all know and love, um, so they have like seven TV shows and three movies in development that are based on PlayStation yeah. games. Um, I don't know if folks have heard about this, but like on the one hand, it's like that's pretty exciting. Like it could be, it hasn't been announced yet, but there could be God of War mm-hmm. movie or TV show. Um, there, we, we've heard that there's gonna be an uh, an Uncharted movie. Uncharted is kind mm-hmm. of like uh, Indiana Jones style Basically. story, like you're yeah. an adventure guy. And you're like a grave robber, but you're like a cool one. You're not like one of those bad ones, right? He's like cool, right? Is he a good guy? I don't know. He's, I mean, he is a good guy in the way that like white men are good guys, regardless of what. Yeah, you can't. I'm doing this sarcastically. (laughs) I don't know if if the folks at home can tell, but yeah, he's like one of those good grave robbers. Yeah, he's positioned as a good guy, but I mean, I think kind of all of that. I mean. Yeah, that indie, the whole Indiana Jones thing that like got spun out into both Team Raider and Uncharted, I think is a little like we look at it now under the lens of today and we're like, oh, that's kind of problematic and and going into other cultures and stealing uh, their awesome. artifacts and destroying like their historical places is a little Love effed it. up. He does tend to go to places that aren't 
real okay. or like <laughs> mis- like mystical in some way. So I Yikes. guess there's that. But it's still a white dude running running through uh, yeah. mostly black and brown folks lands and wreaking havoc. And I shudder to think where these fictional amalgamations uh, draw their real world inspirations from of these mystery, mysterious, la- exotic lands that he's traipsing through. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so like that's happening. And then we're getting a Last of Us TV series, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, Last of Us is um, zombies. It's like these mushroom, cordycep, fungus type of thing. It gets in people's heads. And I don't know if y'all. You know, this, there's this fungus, it gets in ants' brains, and it grows out of their brains, and then it takes them over, and it makes the ant, like, they control the ant's body. It's like a zombie ant. Well, basically, imagine that, but humans, and you have Last of Us. Um, but it's also, like, a zombie apocalypse to tell human stories. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> the real monsters are the people. Um, exactly. <laughs> So it's like, okay, like, that's cool. And then meanwhile, Lucasfilm and Bethesda, Bethesda made Skyrim, like the Elder Scrolls and the Fallout games. Um, So it's like pretty big studio. They're pairing up um, to make an Indiana Jones game. So speaking of Uncharted, (laughs) Mm -hmm. we have Indiana Jones, the original uh, whip, whip carrying, snake fearing. Nazi Nazi fighting. Nazi punching. Love that Mm -hmm. part. Mm-hmm. Harrison Ford, am I? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Re- yes. Um, so I guess on the one hand, I was like, wow, this is exciting. Like, we're finally taking games seriously as this a storytelling vehicle. Like, we're seeing now that these games, um, like we have we all know as gamers that this has this is true. Like games can be art. Games uh have this great capacity. Um, to move us and all of that. But um, so it's cool to see these taking a bigger step into like the mainstream media. Uh, But it's like, I feel like when we talk about what we're looking for from games and stories, this is like not what we asked for. Like... (laughs) Like Uncharted was made in 2007. The Last of Us came out in 2013. Um, the fact that like, like that Hollywood's deciding to go there to look for exciting, new, diverse tales instead of like looking outside to a new source just kind of makes me feel like, okay, you've learned nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like we're just kind of continuing to do what we know. Like, uh, like these are just kind of the same it's the same formula of like well these white stories are guy. already derivative <laughs> right that's exactly like like the last of us is a, an amazing video game that i love playing but the you you rip away the gameplay and and lose like that important piece of how you interact with that story and the actual narrative is like what it's the road mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. basically um, and also like the walking dead like yeah and, you know, Uncharted is, yeah, it's just Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. But what makes that game experience fun is that you're getting to be him and run through an action movie. But these games were already derivative. They were already taking, they were already aping what Hollywood was doing and giving you a way to be a part of it in an interactive experience. And mm. so then, like, taking that back, like, it feels like a copy of a copy of a copy in a Mm -hmm. way that doesn't I I don't know I mean I'm excited to see what they do with these properties in the sense that like it'll be interesting to watch but I mean we've never had a great video game movie and I I'm not holding my breath Mm -hmm. and it makes me scared that yet again we're gonna see that instead of taking this story as inspiration or like using it as a jumping off point to create a story that actually reflects uh you know our contemporary identities and the kind of world we're living in i feel like we're still gonna stick to this rote formula and just sprinkle in like people of color and queer people Mm -hmm. and diverse perspectives as like side characters or as like 
props to make the white male hero look better. Like, I just, Mm -hmm. I don't have high hopes. Like, I feel like I already am tired. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've never been really banging the drum for us to have uh, video game adaptations in TV and movies. Like, I just, I just think what makes video game narratives powerful is that interactive piece. And I think when you strip that away, you're really losing something foundational to why that was an engaging experience. Yeah, I don't, it, it just frustrates me because like even like when you think about The Last of Us, there was hundreds of hours of gameplay that they couldn't even fit into The Last of Us Part Two. Like there were whole story arcs about the Seraphites, which were like a, this cultish organization um, that's sort of an antagonist to you throughout the game. And you barely really scratch the surface of learning about what the motivations of this group even are or what their culture is or what their lives were like. And Uh, Neil Druckmann talked about how the director of the game talked about how they had an entire day, a whole other day. Like the game, so Last of Us 2, it's split up into three days and you play each day. Um, And they had a whole other day. That's like a whole other leg of the adventure uh, that was just about sort of go deep diving into how these Seraphites live and and why they came about and why they rose up and took power and how they took over the city of Seattle. And so the idea that we're just going to sort of rehash these stories that we've already heard, but, oh, now it's a movie or a TV show instead of a game. It's just like, I feel like there's nothing wrong with taking inspiration from those worlds. Like just, just from that, from that example, like there's so many stories you could tell within these universes. Like, look at what they're doing with Star Wars, like how they're sort of spinning out all these, you know, new stories and new characters from from the source material that we know and love. Like, why not do the same instead of just reaching for the same old story? Like, instead of seeing Ellie and Joel's story again played by some other white people, I'd rather learn about a Seraphite who had to come up in the streets of Seattle. And, um, like, I noticed that a lot of the Seraphites in the last of us were like Asian and, and people of color. And it's just like, I want to hear about other people in this same world. Like, like I love the mm. world. I'd love to come back to it, but show me something new. Well, and I, uh, even in the first last of us game, uh, but both last of us games, there's a lot of artifacts that are scattered around the world that you can find that tell like little pieces of story about certain people. And, and one thing that I think that both of those games do pretty, uh, expertly in my opinion at least it resonated with me is that when you're in a certain area you might find a lot of letters or artifacts from a specific like person and their story and what was happening with them and you can Mm. kind of try to follow what was going on with that individual or group of individuals in that area and so you get almost like a side story but it's being told through all these bits and pieces that you can find. I remember in the first game, there's the whole story of, I think was his name Ishmael. Do you remember what I'm talking oh, about? But on, do you know, you know what I'm talking I about? I know what you're talking about. I love that part of the game as well, just because the world is apocalyptic and empty. It's like, yeah, it's a way of seeing what's happened to all these people, but go on, go on. Uh, yeah. But basically you, um, you're walking along a coast and you come across like a, a wrecked ship you find an initial like di- bit of diary on the ship that's like written by this loner guy who had when the apocalypse, you know, the zombie apocalypse basically mm-hmm. first started happening. He got on his boat and he got the hell out of Dodge uh, <laughs> and like managed to survive just by staying the hell away from people. And you find his initial diary. You understand that that's what he's doing. And then you're moving through the sewers of the city from the shore into the sewers. Mm. And you're finding more information from him. And basically he like met up with some other survivors and they started this little community and he learned to like be back around people and you get this whole story and like it just it ends really tragically. And you have this whole moment of like being really sad and having what a happened? To start- Wait, oh, you don't remember? Yes. Yeah, so no. like, they built this community up and then like someone got infected. And you actually, there's a point where you go into a room and there's some like small bodies that Uh have been covered over and then a body of another, like an adult human. And essentially like you realize that like basically they weren't going to be able to survive. And this Mm -hmm. guy like brought the kids into a room and killed them, like murder suicided so that none of them would turn um, and have to go through that. So, but like basically, yeah, the whole little community died and just through notes just through scraps of little items you're piecing together these stories that are just as compelling as like the main quest Mm -hmm. yeah so in that regard yeah it is a little like okay we're gonna hear joel and ellie's story again which is like 
it's just so it's not dissimilar from the road. It's not dissimilar even from Logan. Right. Anyone, anyone watched the X Men movie? Like the Logan? Wolverine like, story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like very similar to that. Um, and just like, do we need another gruff? Uh, there was also the uh, wasn't there a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger like Maggie or something <laughs> like that? It was called that was basically right. just The Last of Us. It's like a dude gruff, escorting a girl gruff, somewhere. Gruff older white man uh, who has a soft side deep <laughs> in, deep in his heart, uh, but he's a killer on the outside, and he's going to escort this young girl. Yeah. Across the country, yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, it just breaks um, my heart because there's so much that never sees the light of day that goes into mm-hmm. these games, and this could be a great opportunity to expand these worlds even further. Um, but hey, I mean, I guess we can hold on hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it'll be interesting just to see the world adapted. Like I think yeah. I'll. I'll be intrigued just to see what they do with it, but um, I totally agree with you. It would be, I'd be, I think I'd be more excited about any of these properties if they were taking, like Uncharted, I feel like, just leave it, why are we, I don't even understand. I don't even understand why we're pursuing Uncharted. We had Uncharted. It's called Indiana Jones. We don't need it again in this day and age. Like, what's going to be your interesting take on this? I don't expect one. And it's at the same time. It's like, we're getting Indiana Jones as a game and Uncharted as a TV show at the same time. Like, why did we need this? It's absolutely like, yeah, like, I'm sorry, have we completely run out of ideas? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like, let's just do all this at once. Um, Yeah, I just, I just don't need that. But I, I, to some, you know, like, there's certain worlds that video games have created that it would be interesting to see them explore. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, give me a story set in the world of The Last of Us. It doesn't have to be Ellie and Joel's story. Give me a story set in like even the world of the of God of War. Like, yeah, let's let's have a fucking show about the pantheon of Greek gods. Although actually what I want is it set in the world of Hades. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where all of the, the Greek gods. Everyone's are, sexy. S- everyone's sexy. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Has a nice yeah. voice and has an ASMR side gig. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm just not super looking forward to this continued Ouroboros of Team <laughs> Hollywood and video game industry just feeding itself for the next 10 years. <laughs> God. Yeah, when you put it that way. <laughs> anyway, um, but let's. Let's uh, not to be too down in the dumps. There's lots, lots, lots to be excited about in the, in the gaming industry. Um, what have you been up to? What have you been playing? Uh, so so kind of similar to you, I'm still on my Perso- Persona 5 Royal mm. journey. I have... Saga. <clears throat> saga, yes. I'm 178 hours into the game. Oh, shit. I have uh, made it into the final semester, the added <gasps> content. Uh-huh. I have... Uh, dipped my toes into that uh into that first pal into that palace that is the new content who i can't wait to like deep dive on this with you when i actually oh finish God. this game i am yeah. so in for what this uh this added piece here that royal has given us uh, is gonna bring um i'm just gonna say two words hot morgana yes oh my god yeah <laughs> If you know, you know. Oh my god. Um, so yeah. Uh so I I, I <laughs> as much as that game is at the front of my mind, I want to finish it and then mm-hmm. we can lose our, our collective shit about it. Um because <laughs> I don't want to just uh bore our listeners talking about the same game on the podcast every week. Jeez. How dare we? Um so kind of to that end, you know, because like uh oh woe is us we have day jobs and full lives and not enough time to just play video games all the time so we have something fresh to share with our podcast (laughs) listeners every week boo hoo life is hard life is so hard um but like (laughs) when we play long games it's gonna take us like a month like that's just the reality of what we're doing here we're not in the games industry we're not cranking through uh, a game a week when we're playing longer stuff. Um, so I had an I had an idea, Spencer, uh, that I wanted to pitch you on. I love and ideas. You, you, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you just collectively love ideas. <laughs> Any idea, I love it. <laughs> you work in tech, don't you? I'm um, easily entertained. <laughs> <laughs> um. So so yeah. So I have this idea of like a segment that we could that we could sprinkle in here from time to time. Yeah. Um. 
but but so I've been having conversations with people and we've heard from a lot of our listeners saying like, oh, you know, like I, I used to play games and like your podcast is helping me get back into games or mm. like I'm really interested in games, but I don't really know where to start. Mm. And so I had an idea of like maybe every once in a while on the podcast we could make uh, just some some little gaming recommendations of games that are really low barrier to entry. Nice. Like stuff that's free um, that you could get on mm. that's free or low cost that is relatively short to play that the mechanics are straightforward that you can get on a uh, on a computer that's not very advanced or you can get on your phone stuff that doesn't require you to have like a big console or mm-hmm. um, invest a lot of money or time to experience it but it might still be something interesting for you to check out um, especially if you're trying to like dip your toes back into the gaming waters. Nice. So, so this is this is my idea. What do you think? Oh my god, I love it! But okay, what's this segment called? <laughs> okay, so uh, you know, <laughs> as as you know from when we were trying to name this podcast, uh, the way I brainstorm is that I just write that. I mean, I guess this is how people brainstorm, right? She I loves just, lists. I just make a list, right? And so I made a li- made a list. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this at like midnight last night. Um, so uh, I want all of your judgment, okay? I think I personally think these are all terrible, but here's what uh, I came up with, and hopefully you will come up with something better from my brainstorm. Oh my god, I'm ready. Which is which is how we named this podcast as well. I <laughs> threw out a lot of horrible ideas, and then Spencer came back with something great. Oh god, they were not horrible. <clears throat> I think they were horrible. Um, okay, first up. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe I'm going to read this list. Jamie Jams. <laughs> Jamie Jams. Oh my god, that sounds like your EP. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So you can see, you can watch my brain in action, right? Here, then Jamie joints. Oh, <clears throat> that's <throat> um, that's a slightly different startup idea that we're working on in the background. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Pixel picks. <laughs> Pixel picks. Okay, okay. My brain's going Pokemon Snap, but my heart says yes. What's next? Okay, small doses. Oh, okay. Medicinal. I'm picking that up. Okay. Pick. Wait. Are, wait. What was that last one again? Small doses, which Small I didn't doses. realize is the name of another podcast. So we probably can't use Oops. that one. Sorry, y'all. Um, Lil Rex. <laughs> Lil Rex. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Simple sessions. <laughs> That's our stripped down acoustic uh, recording of the episode. Uh, and then, and then I closed out with sample size. And then I think I probably fell asleep. So sample size. Okay. That. Um. My mind is saying clothing. I'm. I'm seeing prototypes. <laughs> I'm. Um. Okay. I think there were two standout here. My mind is going right back to little pics, <laughs> like. It's so cute and small and sounds easy to pick up. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So I mean, Lil, Lil Picks, that's actually a combination of Pixel Picks and Lil Rex. Oh, Lil Rex. <laughs> I was thinking of... I was um, picturing a little T-Rex, like with his oh, little yeah. hands. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like that. Lil Rex. <clears throat> I could put okay. in a little, I could put in a little, little baby T-Rex. Roar. <laughs> Okay, if we can find that, then I think that solidifies it. That solidifies it. All right, so, Jamie, like, do you have a little wreck for us? I do. I do have a little wreck for us. I don't know. We we might have to change this. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, yeah, so my little wreck for today. It's lol. It's lol. lil. It's a little Rex. Uh, he's got a little collar. <laughs> it says Rex. Um the the game that I am recommending today is called Emily is Away. Have you heard mm. of this, Spencer? No. Uh, Emily Away is Away is an individual novel uh, developed by Kyle Seeley and was originally released in November 2015. You can mm. get it for free on PC or Mac, and you can basically run this thing on a toaster. <laughs> um, it's it has very low system requirements, really, really, really low. <clears throat> um. And like I said, it's free. So if, if you Google Emily is away, it should bring up the Steam page and you can see there if your your computer can run it. And if it can, you can download it. It takes less than an hour to play. Mm. And it's a little text game that the uh, when you open it up, the screen is set to look like 
Um, if you grew up in the 90s slash early aughts, you probably encountered uh, AOL Instant Messenger or mm. its uh, its cousin, ICQ, mm. which in looking into this, I real- I learned that ICQ was actually named ICQ because it sounds like you're saying I seek you. <gasps> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where ICQ comes from, which I personally was an ICQ user, but I know a lot of people used AO, uh, AIM. I was an AIM gal. Yeah. So this is set up so that it looks like you're logging into AIM or ICQ, and you pick your username, and you set your text color, and you pick your quote for your profile, uh. and then you interact with a handful of friends uh, through the chat, and you're picking um, what you want to say to people. And it actually, it has this cool mechanic where you choose which of like, it, you know, someone sends you a message and you have a few dialogue options of what you can say back. And when you pick it to actually like make it appear on the screen, you have to actually click or you have to actually pretend to type. So you're just like oh. typing gobbledygook, but it's making <laughs> what your choice appear on the screen. So it has wow. this really interesting way of like getting you to interact with it and actually feel like you're participating in the chat. But yeah. Then you have this little conversation with your friends and there's a handful of different friends that talk to you. And it's just kind of this like little slice of life. Um, but it's also about this like misconnection with this girl that you kind of have a crush on named Emily. And so, yeah, it's Emily is away. And you're just getting this little interaction with her. And the developer released a follow up game called Emily is away Two, a uh, T-O-O um, that I started but didn't finish because I started it. I thought it was going to be an hour as well and ran out of time mm-hmm. to finish it. I need to get back to it. That one's a little bit longer, but it's also free. Um, yeah, I think it's worth checking out. I remember when I played it several years ago, just having like a really emotional experience with it. I think if you grew up at that time in like the, you know, and you encountered these chat things and you remember the anxiety of like waiting for someone to message you back and like trying to act like you don't have feelings for someone, but you do. Mm. And you're playing all of those dumb little games that we play at ages 12 and 13 of like hinting that you have a crush on someone, but I'm not going to tell. And right. like, just like stirring up the drama for no reason. I don't know. It really setting song all lyrics as your away message, <clears throat> hoping that they would cut the yes, under, yes. undercurrent of longing that you're trying to project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it captures all of that really well. I think, I was thinking of this game recently because my partner and I uh, finished the newest season of Pen15 not that Mm. long ago, um, which is a show on Hulu um, that folks should also check out. But it's very much about that kind of like growing up in the in the 90s and, and what it felt like to be 13 and just how I don't know. That age, 12, 13 or whatever, junior high, it's so awkward. Intense. It was it's so awkward and comfortable and it feels so intense. It feels like every decision you're making, like your entire life hinges on it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Emily is always a cool little slice of nostalgia to kind of like bring you back to that time and place. And it also uh I don't know, I, I had I remember having like a pretty emotional little experience with it, uh, for it only being like 45, 50 minutes. Yeah, I'm, I pulled out some screenshots just to get a sense of the gameplay. And yeah, like right away, you have that <laughs> green rolling hills with the blue sky and clouds. That's the like default Microsoft background on every desktop. <laughs> uh, and those old beige and blue windows, like it's a real, uh, real nostalgia shot. So cool. I definitely want to check out Emily is Away. Awesome. Uh, so I think... This is a good point then to go ahead and transition into our interview. Rawr. <laughs> yeah, Lil Rex. Rawr. Yeah. Uh, but our guest today is Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. Danielle is a London based artist working to archive Black Trans experience uh, through uh, the game The Black Trans Archive, which is an online browser based game that they build and design in collaboration with other Black Trans folks. We spoke at length with Danielle about her process for creating their games, why she chose this medium for creating an archive, the necessity and importance of archiving the Black trans experience, as well as her own personal history with games and the way that uh, that, that history has impacted her her art and perspective. And like, uh, wow, what we talked like the full hour yeah. with Danielle and probably could have kept going for another hour. And in fact, let like, her go. <laughs> yeah, did, did not want to let them go. And, and would probably like to have her back sometimes. I, and, and she kind of voiced us too, that she'd be interested in, in coming back and sharing more. Um, it just, just a really interesting person, a really thoughtful mm-hmm. person. 
and their art is really interesting. We definitely recommend looking it up. Her entire style is is so unique. Um, and Nostalgic really- too, in a way. Like, yeah, yeah. Very inspired by like retro <laughs> film and the kind of fuzzy VHS TV static. I don't know. Really yeah, cool. yeah, it has like it has that to it and then it also feels a bit like I feel like they draw a lot on um like kind of like the PS1 like polygons. Mm, yeah. And and that form and it it all kind of blends together in in something that feels almost like you're looking through a kaleidoscope. Yeah. Um at any time, but it, it's it's super impactful. So definitely check her work out and uh without further ado, please enjoy this interview with Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. <laughs> Hello to our wonderful guest, Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. Thank you so much for joining us in the virtual pixel therapy studio. Um, Before we jump into the questions, would you mind taking a minute to just introduce yourself, your pronouns, um, and what you do, how you spend your time? Hi, uh, my name is Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. Um, I guess I'm a digital archivist that makes interactive games um, that center Black trans people. How I spend my time, I mostly spend my time rendering in Blender and dreaming <laughs> about making a card game. That's how I spend my time. Amazing. And Danielle, um, what does a digital archivist do? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess hmm, the best way to describe it would be trying to take your experience and put it in a virtual world um, mm. that can, one, hold that experience, and two, uh, retell uh, that experience, but using a different way of saying it. It's like a not one for one representation of what happened, but it's mm. more of creating a environment that holds that particular mm. event in time. And why do you think it's important to create these environments to preserve um, these experiences? Yeah. Um, It all started when I was looking at archives and I was trying to find representation of black and trans people throughout the archive. And Mm. the representation available was rubbish. It was really bad. It would usually be from someone else, someone else's opinion on this person's body or a poster on a black trans person in like 1960s that warns you to get away from her Um, Mm. rather than an actual first-hand account from these individuals. And so I started thinking, like, maybe these archives can't actually even hold this particular experience. The way these archives work were not set up to actually hold and record and store these experiences. And Mm -hmm. so instead, I need to think of a new way that I can try and record those around me, but have their experiences within the archive from the ground up so that uh, there'll be less erasure that happens. Mm-hmm. And that's how I kind of like got into doing it this way. How, because uh, it kind of started for me because I was doing it for myself as a form of therapy. So every day I would mm-hmm. go and render something, regardless how I was feeling. It would just be a diary, essentially. I would just write or draw in Blender, which is a 3D program. And um, whatever happened there happened. And eventually I would start implementing my friends, implementing pictures of my friends, modeling my friends until that became the main point of doing it is actually I need your representation in, in this way so that someone from across the sea can know that you exist. And the words Mm. you say that you say to me that I feel strongly about can exist longer than, um, long, uh, longer than we will essentially. Yeah. 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 No, I, I love in your game development blog, um, you had written a passage where, you talked about um, how you wrote, creating these stories really allows me to focus on creating something that would make us feel proud to be Black and trans. I think that it's incredible to um, to create this space that allows for the beauty and, um, and memory um, and pride of Black trans people to flourish. Um, it reminded me what you were just saying of a book that I was reading earlier this summer. Um, it's called Female Husbands by... Uh, a scholar in the U.S. uh, by the name of Jen Mannion, um, who is a non-binary writer. Um, And it's about, um, like, in the early, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, there were people, 
scattered across North America who were assigned female at birth, um, but would live as live as men in quotes, mm -hmm. um, and who would um, like there was no language at that time to describe like non-binary or trans masculine identity, um, but they were these people who. Um, having never, like there was no community, there was no sign from this author's research that they, that they had ever found each other. Um, but in locations like hundreds of miles apart, there would be people who um, were living as men with wives, um, contributing to communities, um, and just having this shared experience that this author was then able to connect into this constellation of a, of a shared history. Um, and so, I don't know, just the idea of it's, it can sometimes feel like, um, like as trans people that we are, at least for me, like it feels like, especially earlier in my discovery of myself, I was just sort of groping around in the dark, um, putting myself together and, building myself uh, and not really knowing if what I was doing was right or acceptable. Um, but then as soon as I found someone else who resonated with that, it was just this such a powerful instance of, of connection. Um, so anyway, <laughs> it's hard to put words to these, to this whole trans experience thing, but um, I just love everything that you're doing and really excited to be here with you. Um, with that in mind, um, you know, we've kind of been touching on the fact that you make games. Um, what's your personal history with video games? Like, do you identify as a gamer? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I definitely would. <laughs> uh, I've been in an in and out relationship with games. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was younger, um, my dad used to play uh, like PS1 and Sega Mega Drive, actually. Um, and so I used to play like Road Rash, Command uh, mm -hmm. Fodder, um, Sonic. And then when there was a PlayStation 1, it was... Uh, Spider-Man, Blade, this Star Wars game. Um, and the first time I remember playing a video game, actually, was uh, Spider-Man 1. And I would watch my dad play, and then he handed over the controller, and then I was just terrified because I had <laughs> to destroy this bad guy and I didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I kind of fell in love because I had responsibility over how this environment reacted to my actions that I put in. And that's kind mm -hmm. of been my love throughout what video games can do. Mm. Um, and so I kind of like love them for that, the way that they set up parameters and rules that you respond to and feel responsible for. Mm -hmm. And the one game that actually made me start really thinking about like what my actions are doing to these people was actually Metal Gear Solid 2. Mm. And, um, I think I hadn't killed someone in, in six, seven hours. I hadn't, I hadn't even killed anyone from the beginning. And the first person I shot, I felt bad. And I was mm. like, I didn't even have to shoot that person. I could have just walked by. And that's when I was like, okay, this pla this kind of, these games can do something. They can actually make you think about what you're actually doing and that choice that you made. Um, and then I started falling out, out of love with games because I started trying to find some trans representation and then finding mm -hmm. and seeing Leisure Suit Larry's trans representation and being like, okay, <laughs> that's not what we want. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I joke that there's a pain price. That's kind of a joke, but it's a pain price that I have to pay for any game that I play, especially an RPG, just to get through character creation. Because mm. so often, immediately, okay, are you male or female? doesn't right. matter how, how intricate and detailed the the design, like I could have 200 faces to choose from and hundreds of mm -hmm. skin color and hair color and shape of my face and shape of my body. I can control all of that. But as soon as I'm ready to be like, okay, go, it's like, oh, okay. But after all of that, are you, but, 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 what, but what genitals do you have that we're never going right. to see in this game? Right. Um, and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like I actually, um, <laughs> the first time, <laughs> Um, so I have a very similar like thing with character customizations in that like I love them because it feels mm -hmm. like the only opportunity you get to put yourself in a game in a world that someone's made and then at the same time you hate them because you mm -hmm. realize all the choices that they have none of them are for you mm -hmm. <laughs> none of them yeah. were like you you can pick these options if you pick male and if you can mm -hmm. pick these options if you pick female if you want to mix them they're like excuse me you mm -hmm. have to stop um, yeah. and so that's like I, I like 
hate them for that. But I remember in one game called Dragon's Dogma, um, you could create two characters. And at the mm-hmm. time I was like very, I was like mentally transitioning more than like physically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I created how I looked now and then how I wanted to look. And I played mm-hmm. how I wanted to look and how I look now kind of like haunted me as my dead name um, <laughs> and followed me about casting spells. Yeah. I remember it was the first time in like in my life I was like, right, mm-hmm. I feel like I am represented in a game. Um, even yeah. though I had to pick my gender and all of that stuff, I was like, I am there because it let me have my history, but it also let me have my truth. And I was yes. like, yes, oh. yes, uh, I love that. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. I think because I'm just like y'all are so close to getting it and then you just shoot yourselves in the foot. Like you give us all of these options. You tell us that you want us to bring our full identity to the game, but then you're putting yourself back. (laughs) You're setting yourself back by then ending it by having us choose male or female. Like I'm just like, don't you see how your own creativity could be unleashed if you just let people create an avatar that doesn't have any, like we're already living in a fantastical universe. Like why do we have to bring the you know, Eurocentric, cis, heteronormative patriarchy into this. Yeah. I wanted to bring up um, something that you had brought up um, in an interview that you did with Berlin Artlink. Um, and you were talking about how even before you learned how to make games, um, you would use film to kind of create these videos um, of video game scenarios and these gamified scenes. And, and that kind of got you into game design. Um, that and uh, playing Telltale's The Walking Dead um, was something mm-hmm. that you said really inspired you. And so I was wondering if you could kind of talk about um, that period in your life that you were referring to and specifically the impact of The Walking Dead on on your your um, art yeah uh so for me it started with i really wanted to start making games i thought okay this is something i i want to do i have a passion to do but i have no skill or training in doing it um and so i said okay how do i start i need to start with maybe knowing how to make a render of something knowing how to make a 3d character and so i downloaded blender and i looked at it and I ran away from it for about three, four months because it was just, mm. the interface was disgusting. It was just, I was like, no, this is ridiculous. Yeah. It, you, you had to click with um, right click instead of left click. I was like, absolutely no. I can't even click on anything. I'm gone. Um, and then it wasn't until I downloaded this very small program called Photo Anim, which let you mm. take photos of yourself or anything. Uh, and it would turn, turn, uh, turn it into a 3D object in about two seconds flat. Mm. And then you could use that. And then I said, okay, this is kind of something that could work. Um, But again, so I started using Blender more and more. And I would use it as a diary, as I said before. And I would just use it to type down things and say, like, I had a horrible day. Type it down. I had a great day. Type it down. Um, Something inspired me, represented me. I would take a picture of it, make it 3D, right, put it in the world. Um, But at the time, I had no idea, one, that... You can make it's very small games on Blender using the game engine that was on the old version. But two, I just didn't understand how it worked. It was still magical to me. I didn't understand how to get a character to move. It didn't make sense to me. And so what I would do is um, I would say, right, I won. The first one I made was actually a point and click game called um, Unarchived Adventures, I think. Um And I said, okay, I want to make a point and click game. I can't make a point and click game. So what I'll do is I'll render, uh, pre-render a bunch of um, backgrounds and then I'll put it all into a Premiere Pro and then edit it as if someone's playing it. So it would look like a game. Yeah. And that was my like first idea into like, okay, how would this work? What happens if you clicked on this and start like kind of making flow diagrams of how this particular path would play out. Um, So when I made that, I was like, right. I love this. Like, this can really work. I wish this existed. It kind of made me hungry to actually make it. It felt like a concept video, like a Mm -hmm. demo, like a demo that you see. Like, Mm -hmm. this is how the PlayStation can run graphics. But instead, it's like, this is how your game could make, could exist, but you can't make it. Um, (laughs) And and so for a while, I got really, like, a a bit frustrated um, because a lot of my work would have interactive elements in them, but no interactivity. So... Mm. 
Yeah. I'd often be putting in screens where you could select like your gender, where you could select pronouns, where you could select what happens, where you could select where to donate to. Um, and this like false activity would play out. Um, and so I had a lot of questions from audience members being like, why can't I pick this option? Or mm. I like the fact that I couldn't pick up this option. Or oh, I felt like a passenger. And to me, mm. I was like, right, there's something wrong because I, you can't feel like a passenger. I need you to be actively involved and responsible for what happens. Um, and so I was trying to figure out a way to make a game, make a game that worked. And yeah. seeing the Telltale Walking the Dead, Walking the Dead, <laughs> Walking Dead, um, that was a way for me to be like, right, this essentially is an FMV game. It's essentially a game that plays out a scene and then asks you for a reaction and then plays out another scene. And for me, that felt a lot more doable because the coding is just would be stitching together scenes that I could make. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and I played all of those games in one sitting. I played every day. I played from the first game to the last game in one sitting. Wow. Um, because it was just amazing. I just I had never played anything that carried on your choices that made by the end Clementine. I was just, I didn't yeah. want to. Like, What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I can't. Um, I was so invested, and I said, "This is what I want. This is the kind of investment I want to have in a game where my choices feel like I'm responsible for everything playing out." Yeah. Um, and so I would also look up games like D uh, for the I think it was, it was PlayStation. Um, which is like an FMV game and all these other FMV games um, on just how they would work um, and how to stitch it together. Um, and that's kind of how I, I designed my first game, which was a uh, resurrection. No, not a resurrection. Like it was um, black trans archive.com. Um, and essentially what I did is I just made two hours of footage and plotted out every single path and rendered every single path in actual film. Um, and then stitched it together. And it was really, it was really hard. I didn't have any, I didn't know how to do flow, di- flow diagrams properly at that point. So I actually did a lot of it on the fly. Um, wow. And it was, yeah, it was so hard. I really enjoyed it, but it was really, really, really hard. Um, but once that worked and we got a coder to put it together, I realized that things like this were possible. It was actually possible to actually have something that one ran online. I didn't think it was going to run online, but one ran online um, and two played and looked like a game. Yeah. Um, and so that's how, that's how everything really kicked off. And uh, ever since I've just been, that's all I do. Yeah. Um, now, just for the folks at home, I, I wanted to just define an FMV game is a full motion video game. Um, and it's a, it's a narration technique that uh, uses pre-recorded files and videos, um, basically exactly what Danielle was saying. It's a, it's a genre of games um, called FMV. Um, and Danielle, I was wondering if maybe you could speak to why, um, you, why film kind of spoke out to you as a medium and, and what film brings to the experience of um, Resurrection Land and, and the Black Trans Archive. I think film brings a kind of... That's a good question. <laughs> um, I guess I guess for me, I was more adept in using film um, techniques to create images. Um, I mean, I hadn't trained in any of these, but one thing that I found easier to pick up was editing software, because I'm a nerd. So picking up editing software was very good, um, very easy. Um, and also something that I do within every work I try um, and make is subtitles and so to subtitle it it was just so much easier to actually do it in a film to like I write out my subtitles my subtitles are kind of embedded in that and the actual aesthetic rather than uh an afterthought they're actually part of the actual work um and so for me film and I, I've been watching films like Water Men and Women I've been uh Water Men and Women I've been watching um a lot of indie queer black films and that's the kind of scene I guess I was from. I was from a more performance um, burlesque it, underground video scene. Um, and so that's what I could draw. That's the knowledge I can draw from and uh, the questions I could ask, those could be answered. And so for me, they felt, it felt like an easier in. It felt like a bit yeah. of a Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, I I find that they like in my experience of playing both games. So the games can be found at resurrectionland.com and blacktransarchive.com. Um, but this sort of it there's a certain like retro, almost like mm. a ghost in the machine kind of feel where um like the digital world can feel so much like an afterlife or, or like a like another plane. Like it's alive and it's not and it's um just like a really interesting space. And so um, I think behind that question was really just my artsy fartsy take on like, I think it's really cool that the film aesthetics you brought into these games really create a really special environment. <laughs> So about these games, um, you know, I feel like we could talk um, about them each, both Resurrection Land and the Black Trans Archive um, for hours. Um, these are games that, as Danielle said earlier, um, they reimagine archives of Black trans history as interactive experiences. Um, from your website, Danielle, um, you write, the act of crafting pro-Black and trans environments can help us visualize futures that seek to appreciate Black trans existence, a world that is healthy for Black trans people to live in, challenging the idea of what an archive can be and how they are accessed. Resurrection Lands offers an alternative look into what it means to archive someone that history once erased. Um, and so, you know, so often as trans people, it feels like online, in media, in our workplaces, um, we have very little control over the objectification of our bodies by non-trans people. We have very little control um, over the the fear and uh, misunderstanding or, or misplaced feelings that, that non-trans people have towards us. Um, and as your work explores, people who are both trans and Black face intersecting and compounding threats of erasure. Um, gamifying the access to the archive, making someone aware that they are entering a sacred space, um, really, like you said earlier, putting their responsibility on the player of entering the space and affecting it. Um, it feels like it it directly subverts that. It shifts power back to Black trans folks um, to take control of their own narratives um, and to 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 be powerful in the space. And um, I guess I'm wondering, do those thoughts resonate at all? Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, in the in the act of choosing the format of a video game for the archive, um, what kind of space uh, were you hoping to create? Yeah. So the Black Trans Archive came out um, from working with, I think it was 15 different Black trans people. None of them were video game designers. Um, I think some were artists, but uh, they weren't hired to, to be artists. What was done is that all of us would design a character, um, would design a landscape, and then we kind of spoke about the interactions within that space. And from those conversations, we were talking about what, do, where does this archive need to be? Um, and that's how we got to it. it. needs to be online. It needs to be accessible for everyone to see. This is the problem with archives is that they're not accessible. They're usually a place and this place should be everywhere. And two, how do we make sure that we continue to be centered even though it's accessible to everyone? And that's how the the kind of game aspect really was just accepted, um, because I was I was also happy to go with something that said if you didn't pick black and trans you couldn't enter, but instead we kind of took an approach that said no if you don't pick black and trans you get a completely different experience you get an experience tailored to your identity your identity is also what is in the archive and the archive reacts to you. And so it was a process of trying to build an archive that looked at the player and said, right, you've made this choice. You have this identity. You need to do this or you can't be in this space or you're responsible for these things. Um, and making it impossible to be passive. It was just something you could not be passive in this space. We didn't want that. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was actually, it was a, it was just a, it was a kind of amazing process. Like everyone was paid, which was amazing. 
Um, but it was it was also just extremely difficult for us to think about what it meant to archive our experience and not center it on anyone else but our own. Um, and that's I think that's how we got more fantastical and more um, elaborate because usually when trans people are asked to do an archive or even just speak about themselves, it has to do with body trauma, pain and whatever. You know, that's what that's what the I guess the mainstream is interested in us is how have you been misrepresented? Oh, how painful are you? How much pain have you gone through? Um, rather than anything to actually do with our lives. And so when we were actually asking ourselves, what do we want to say? Like, what do we want to say to each other? Um, it became really difficult to actually comprehensively say, like, I just want to. I just want to make up a world that we exist in and we're the center of. I was like, right, what happens in that world? I have no idea. Um, and so we kind of got to this place of like looking back to the past, speaking to past black trans people who um, have died, but we don't know why they've died. They could have lived their happy lives. They could have lived sad lives. We have no idea. But just being them being present and being able to say hello to us and us to be able to have that connection with these past black trans people that history refuse to acknowledge, but also to acknowledge and um, store our present selves and the ways that we think within the archive. Um, something that I, I'm really into is actually how like you can use, and how a lot of games do it, use like science fiction and just like a completely made up narrative to actually talk to a specific experience. So in the game, there's this place called the passing, the non-passing fields. Um, and in the non-passing fields, um, you get to go up to this statue that just tells you, um, you don't have to pass. There's power in not passing. We love you for not passing, all of these things. Um, and that was a way of us talking about passing, but also saying that it's not something that you need to att go to if that's not what you feel comfortable. Cause I feel like we're pushed to feel comfortable to pass rather than to feel comfortable with it, with ourselves. Um, and so I've, I've kind of forgotten your question, but I've, um, you're, you're <laughs> it was just, it was just a, a really great, difficult process of, um, figuring out how we build a world that talks to our experience but never recreate trauma or pain, um, but has it present in the space. Right. Um, and that's, I feel like that's something that that project managed to capture is that as someone said to me after they played it, they said, um, I was waiting for something bad to happen and it never did. Yeah. And I was like, that's perfect because you, 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 I, I feel like they had a particular experience of what trans work is. And we didn't do that, which I thought I was like, okay, that's really good. I don't want you to have that painful experience. I don't want you to have an experience where you're supposed to be centered and then you're triggered. <laughs> it's not the one I want. Right. Um, yeah. And also, sorry, one last thing. Um, the the reason why everyone's so when we set it up, um, so before you play it online, and if we've also installed it in a couple of places, but before you play it online, there's like a precursor message that says, if you're not black and trans, you'll feel uncomfortable. Um, you're not welcome in this space if you don't support black trans people. And the whole kind of beginning section, the premise is for you to know that this environment was not made for you if you're not black and trans, but you are being let in. And that, uh, that making someone uncomfortable um, is important for them to sit in being uncomfortable was so important for us because one thing that I've experienced in a lot of my past work is this kind of trans tourism, this idea of looking at and finding trans bodies appealing and interesting in ways that are damaging for us. And that was a way of fighting back to that, making people feel guilty for picking the wrong identity and for making the wrong choice and they don't even know why like making them feel responsible and guilty um, and making them know they've done something wrong um, is something that I, I'm trying to even to push even further in my new work. Yeah. No, I thank you so much for everything you just said. Um, I think that, oh my God, there was so much to unpack there, but um, I think around, the, um, 
like passing, like when you're saying, you know, we as trans people, it's like, we're still pushed even in, in places where our experience is allegedly centered, we're still being pushed to define ourselves in, in language and in ways that make sense and are comfortable to cis people. And I think that there was, um, you know, for me as, as a guest in the space, um, just having someone acknowledge like, hey, it's okay not to pass or like, there are so many ways to be trans, like, like even things that I know because I've had to tell myself or chosen family has been there to tell me and remind me it's still nice to have someone else mm. uh, or to enter a space that is designed to include that. Like, you know, so often the mainstream uh, gaming industry is quick to be like, hey, marginalized people, if you don't like it, go make your own. And right. it's like, well, even acknowledging the fact that, um, you know, I, I, we live in a moment where society is insisting that trans people are a new fad, even though we have always existed. And yet you're in telling me that I don't belong, uh, that I need to create a space just for me. Like you're assuming yourself as the default. The binary was made up not that long ago. Like exactly. if anything, you're, you're, the, you're the made up, you're the new one here. You know, I, I guess the reason that I'm on a video game podcast is that I feel like video games are inherently trans like mm. they are a art form or a medium that gives you the opportunity to transcend your body um and as a kid um it was video games that really gave me the first opportunity to walk around and kiss and fight as a person of a completely different gender who wasn't defined by my biological sex mm. um long before I knew the word trans or even had access to other people who identified in similar ways. Um, and I think you mentioned a few titles, but I was wondering if there were any games that you look back on and think, okay, yeah, that, that game helped me figure out some stuff or that game, like awoke, it awoken something in me. Um, like, are there any games that you think back on as like queer trans moments for you? Oh God, there's loads. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mentioned Dragon's Dogma. That was, that was um, one, but there was also Monster Hunter, um, where you could just kind of be like a strong ass female character, just destroying these monsters. Um, there was also Sims. What I liked about Sims is that you could simulate a family <laughs> that accepted you, <laughs> um, and so like it was just like it was there. Like you know, the only problem was that your sim couldn't reach the toilet, so they'd pee on the floor. But that, your transness <laughs> wasn't really an issue. Um, oh, what else? Gosh, um, there was Mass Effect. Actually, oh god, yeah. Um, there was Pokemon. Oh, so many and. Um, Often then, I'm a big fan of text adventure games, actually, like a huge, huge, huge fan. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but there was this one, it was like an online, I guess, game, or it's like fake AI where you talk to a robot and it talks back to you. And it was like early days, like RuneScape days. And I would talk to this robot and ask all these like questions. Um, and then like, you know, like, oh, what am I? Oh. I didn't know what trans was. I didn't know any of those um, I had no idea what any of this was, but I knew I was, I needed something. Um, and I would ask all these questions and the robot would, you know, reply very badly, you know, what do you mean you feel this way? Oh, do you, are you what? Like, blah, blah, blah. Um, but also I'm MMOs. For me, those are the ones, those are the ones, those are the ones you can find an actual community. Something I love about MMOs is that, communities build something the MMO never intended to exist. So you can find like trans hubs in MMOs. Um, and I was a big RuneScape fan. I didn't know how to do anything apart from walk around. Um, so I got scammed a lot. Um, <laughs> but I was a huge, but I mean, they got nothing. <laughs> but I was a huge MMO fan, like for the community and for asking particular questions and for having online partners and um trying trying out things and have a hotel and club penguin club, club penguin was just a bit fun but <laughs> um so yeah i think there's so many but um yeah i think also one that sticks out um to me i'm i'm a huge playstation early poly polygonal um person like i really like these early graphics i think you can probably tell um 
I have a, I guess, a nostalgia for PS One, but now I have an appreciation for the further back ones. So I'm currently looking at the first Elite and like Wireframe games. Um, but for me, when I played Urban Chaos on the PlayStation One, that that really spoke to me. And I don't know, I think it was the first time I ever saw a female black protagonist ever. Um, and I was just like, right, I want to play this till my heart's content. And I would just, I would just walk around and look at her and be like, I, I just I had a really appreciation that she was there, even though she was like a cop and killing people. Like I just had a real appreciation that she did exist and it was possible. Because I yeah. think about something about these games is that it makes it, it makes the existence you want to live feel possible. It makes it feel like a bit, like you can always imagine it, but when you see someone do it on screen, it feels like you're closer to them. And it feels like I did that, so I'm part of it. So it is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there was um, one game. Uh, I have very mixed feelings about it. Very mixed feelings about it. Um, it's by Swery. Um, it's J.J. Abrams' The Missing. You know that one? When you said J.J. Abrams, I was like, uh-oh. But tell us about it. What's The Missing oh, about? God. So, okay. So it's one <laughs> of the only games ever to have a trans writing team. Uh, oh! A rotation <gasps> team. Ever. Ever. Ever, oh. ever, ever. There's a representation of a, a, a trans woman before... Uh, she transitions and all the correct pronouns are used. Um, but it's made by the same person who made Deadly Premonition. If you know the trans representation in Deadly Premonition and Deadly Premonition 2, it's shit. It's okay. uh, it's really bad. Like um, I don't want to spoil the game, but it's really bad. The trans representation is really bad. Um, and then the next game he made was J.J. Abrams' The Missing, which were, is about... I mean, this is kind of spoiling the story, but I need to talk about it. It... It turns out to be about a uh, trans woman accepting herself. Um, and I had a trans writing team. And he hired a bunch of trans women to help him write this character. Um, and the game is kind of centered around trauma. But you feel that the the writers really wrote a trans lesbian couple. Like, it was amazing. It's amazing. It's really amazing to have that representation um, in there. She is blowing herself up. The whole game is about her basically blowing herself up into bits and using it to solve puzzles. So it's a bit strange, um, <laughs> but it's like a, it's a weird, it's a weird one. I just, I find it weird because I'm like something that worked. Um, it's a representation of transits that's marginally better than what we usually get. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I think that was like, I think one of the games that, although I didn't, it didn't like, I guess it didn't, I don't know. I don't know. It clicked with me that like, okay, there's a trans person in the game. And then, but when I, the backstory is more that clicked with me for that game, that a trans team of writers can exist um, and can be hired by a, by a guy who isn't trans and who wasn't good with trans ideas, but wanted to be better. Um, he didn't learn shit. Cause then he made deadly premonition two, which was terrible, but <laughs> which also had another trans character, which he personally wrote, which he misgenders the entire way through. Um, Just to fill folks in a little bit. So um, Deadly Premonition 2, um, the main character, Lena Dowman, is uh, pretty much, as Danielle just mentioned, repeatedly misgendered and deadnamed throughout the game. Um, And even after a point in the story where, uh, you know, uh, another character expresses the importance of accepting marginalized people, et cetera. They continue to dead name Lena throughout the rest yeah. of the game. So really shitty representation. Meanwhile, um, the missing, um, as Danielle was just talking about. Um, so it's described as a surreal mix of coming of age drama and survival horror. Seems really interesting. Um, if folks want to check that out, it's also been described, uh, been compared to Twin Peaks, um, those kind of vibes. So really cool. His games are really interesting. Um, And he does try and tackle some hard themes. He doesn't do them all very well. Um, But I think The Missing is a quite... It's an interesting one to look at. It's an interesting one to look at. I wouldn't play the Deadly Premonition ones. (laughs) 
On this podcast, we typically like to to end our interviews by asking folks about a, a specific game that stands out to them, that influenced their life in some way. Um, and you mentioned Blade to us. Um, so Blade uh, originally came out for the PlayStation in 2000. Um, and you mentioned that Blade was the first game that you played um, uh, or one of the first games that you played that had a black protagonist. Um, and it made you start to question how people like you and your family could be placed in virtual worlds. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, first, maybe, um, uh, could you describe Blade the game to someone who never has heard of it? <laughs> so Blade the game um, is based on the uh, movie of the same name, Blade, um, in which Wesley Snipes plays Blade. Um, oh, does he play Blade? Yeah, no, he does play Blade. Um, and he's a half vampire, half human who goes around um, killing vampires. And so the game is essentially around the same thing. It's a kind of a, I don't know, I would call it a, a third person beat em up shooter mm. um, with all of those mechanics not working very well. Um, and essentially you just run through levels shooting vampires, werewolves, and um, cops and zombies, I think, um, in a kind of horror action game with very bad um, dance music in the background. Great. And um, I had taken a note here. Um, I think that this is a topic that um, may resonate for a lot of your work, but for folks who, I wanted to take a moment to define um, Afrofuturism for folks who may not be familiar with the term. Um, but to quote Nova Sparks, um, who's a, a black sci-fi and fantasy author, um, in, in Afrofuturism, we imagine ourselves and create whole worlds where we not only achieve greatness, but we are thriving in our own culture. There is a reason why films like Black Panther and novels written by Octavia Butler resonate so much in the African diaspora. We see the possibilities of a society of Black people that is steeped in our history, but also embraces our advancement while protecting both as a means for survival. Seeing this can and has inspired more of us to invest in our communities, to continue to dominate in the STEM field and the arts, and to move forward in our quest to reach back into our communities by creating opportunities and guidance for our youth. Um, and so when you were talking about Blade and talking about how it was the first game you played um, that really made you start to question how people like you and your family could be placed in virtual worlds, I was kind of wondering if, um, you know, like what kind of features did Blade inspire you to imagine? Do you feel like playing Blade um, eventually led to the creation of the games and, and the artwork that you're now uh, making now? Yeah, like I feel I had some influence. I think for me at the time, um, I wondered, one, I wondered what was the process of digitizing, because Wesley Sipes is a real person. I was like, what's the process of digitizing a real person and putting them in an environment that um, they could never physically access? Mm -hmm. um, so what is that? magical process that does that like what does that do to the person what do you have to take away what do you have to add um to get them to exist in this world um and at the same time i also thought about um and I, this is me thinking more now i re recently replayed the game um that digitizing blade is probably the most pro-black thing they did um but the environment is definitely not um, and the environments that these people are usually put in are something that doesn't support them. And often when you have a black character within the game, the environment's trying to kill them as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, when it comes to like futures and the inspiration that game had is that I wanted a game that Blade existed in, that process of digitizing a black body and putting it into an environment existed and I knew how to do it and a black person could do it. Um, but also that the environment wasn't trying to kill them and Blade could put down his sword and and exist. I kind of wanted Blade to exist the same as Snake does in the cutscenes in which he has hours to talk about whatever he wants to talk about. Yeah. Um, and that's how, I guess, though that game kind of, in, kind of, this legacy of that game lives on in me. Um, in the fact that I, it wasn't a good game. Um, it yeah. wasn't, sorry, Blade. It wasn't a good game. Um, it, but it, it was... It was, for me, it was fun, but it wasn't good. It was really scary. Um, but just seeing that character was enough. Um, 
And so the legacy is that of uh, of taking control of the digitizing and the environments um, built around these characters to then make something that speaks to us on a a deeper level than what gameplay is, using Blade as kind of like a gameplay and a noticeable figure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, No, it's it's like one is not enough. And uh, like... We're past the, like, Blade came out in 2000. I think we're ready for more games with Black protagonists that aren't just about, ins- like, trying to kill them as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. I'm personally really excited for this um, upcoming game um, for the PS5, where you are um, a Black person going on a road trip, and oh, you yeah, are it's, it's documenting... So cool. um, I, I'm really excited for it. I'm sorry, did you, did you, t- did you remember the name? No, I didn't. But I didn't. is it Gorgeous. seasons? Seasons. Okay. Yes. Um. So excited for that and for more. Um. Danielle, it's been incredible to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much again for taking the time um, to okay. chat with us. Um. Where can folks find you online? Is there anything you're working on um, that that you'd like folks to know about? Um. Anything? Anything cool happening in Danielle's world? So you can follow me online at. Uh, on Instagram at Lady Dan G F U A, um, or on my website Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. I'm so sorry for that long website <laughs> name. Uh, everything that I make uh, will be is playable online for free, um, and requires nothing but internet. Um, and you can get them all at my website, or you could just type in resurrectionland.com, blacktransarchive.com, um, and I recently released a new one called um i can't remember when i didn't need you i I can't remember a time that i didn't need you um which is about going into a city of fog that can only support trans life and you get to go into a black lives matter protest all that stuff um and that's on my website but what i'm making now is i'm making my first um real-time 3d game that runs in browser um called go find me kind of a riff on GoFundMe, but called GoFindMe, which comes out in January, February, March. And I'm also creating um, a arcade shooter. Wow. That comes out in September. Girl, when do you sleep? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, I have really bad insomnia, so I don't really sleep. So it's okay. <laughs> Danielle, Thank you so much for being here. All of the links to your games and places to find you online, we will make sure to include in the show notes. Um, And thank you again for sharing this space with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, great to be on. Hopefully I come on again. Time is up for today's session of Pixel Therapy. Thank you for tuning in. And we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own. If you want more Pixel Therapy, come check us out at patreon.com slash pixeltherapypod where you can get a monthly bonus episode for just $2 a month plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly. If you're not up for contributing monetarily, but you enjoyed this episode, there are lots of ways you can support us for free, including following us on Instagram and other social media at Pixel Therapy Pod or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. That stuff is just as important and we appreciate it just as much. If you want to reach out to us, you can send us an email at pixeltherapypod at gmail.com. Maybe send us some of your own Lil Rex. Lil Rex. Uh, and we can share them on the show. I'm just going to clip that out. That's going to be the sound effect. <laughs> and, and you can keep up with all things Pixel Therapy by checking out our brand new website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Um, just think of them as ideas for cool shit you should know about and can get involved uh, in locally, nationally internationally, depending on where you are. Um, So it was an absolute honor to share this conversation uh, with Danielle, with all of you. Um, Another person who was on Pixel Therapy, uh, Mars Dixon, they actually helped work on um, the Black Trans Archive. Uh, They're one of the people uh, that uh, Danielle called upon um, to bring this work to life. Um, And Mars was the guest on our episode um, called 
the secret gay history of the Sims, or queer and gaming culture and the secret gay history of the Sims with Mars Dixon. Um, they are a streamer. They are a Black, queer, uh, and Filipino artist. Um, they are super sweet and just an all-around light. Um, and something that they have been doing um, that I was aware about over the summer, this past summer, 2020, um, is that they were actually go like going into a coding boot camp so that they could learn how to like put together and t repair computers for Black trans people. Um, it's something that they've done for a few individuals over the past year. And it's just like, just I think representative of just the type of person that Mars is. Um, mm -hmm. And they have this new Instagram account. <laughs> Uh, it's called Rebooty underscore computers, Rebooty computers. That's R E B O O T Y underscore computers. Um, and they're putting together this, they're starting to organize around this idea of minimizing e waste by, by repairing donated computers to members of the QT VIPOC community in need and really bridging that digital divide um, that is felt by so many marginalized folks. Um, Mars has a Patreon. Um, you can find out more on uh, their Instagram, which can be found at mmdizzy, or you can check out their YouTube and Twitch and other channels. They they play and stream as uh, Wii Gay, like W I I, like Nintendo Wii Gay. Um, I think that that like this org, Rebeauty Computers, like definitely follow it. Definitely stay up to date on what Mars is up to. They're a really cool person that we have in the gaming community. And if you're looking for someone to support with your money, with your time, um, with your just like supportership, followership, definitely give that to Mars Dixon. Um, so yeah, check out Rebooty Computers and MM Dizzy. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel, Pixel Therapy. therapy. Yeah. Rawr. Rawr. <laughs> <laughs>